Welcome to Via the Grapevine, proudly brought to you by Tony DaCosta of Liquor City Claremont and offering you the chance to learn more about wine, the masters behind them, and even which wines to collect. Today, we explore the Durbanville Wine Valley with three of its winemakers, and we discuss what makes this region so special. Uh, as many of you may know, it's a mere 20 minutes drive from Cape Town. The Durbanville Wine Valley is fast becoming Cape Town's destination of choice with its scenic vineyards, uh, its award-winning wines, and friendly atmosphere. So let's start our journey and introductions in order of the farms you'll encounter as you drive out of Cape Town. And first up, the historic De Grendel, a previous guest on Via the Grapevine and uh, a mentor to many. We say welcome Charles Hopkins, cellar master at De Grendel. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Guy. It's a great privilege and honor chatting to you. And uh, from Charles, we've uh, received the Amandelboort Pinotage 2019 and the 2021 Sauvignon Blanc. And those are those two there behind me. Uh, as you travel around the Tigerberg Hill from De Grendel, you'll encounter Durbanville Hills Winery on your right, one of the first wineries I ever did uh, install promotions for. Uh, but just past it, on your left, you'll encounter our next guest. We welcome Piti Kutsia, winemaker and assistant manager at Klein Roosboom. Hi, right, good morning, Guy. Nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. And you've kindly sent me the Klein Roosboom Marnay MCC and That's the My, My Way Sauvignon Blanc Reserve. Thank you, sir. That's excellent. Uh, then, as you drive up from Klein Roosboom, up the Tigerberg Valley Road, you hopefully don't get stuck behind a cement mixing lorry. Uh, and if you do, just be aware that if, you, if you're going to overtake, then as you crest the hill, you'll find our third guest on the left from a farm that I've been wanting to chat to for years. Uh, we welcome Etienne Lowe, who's now winemaker at Natida. Welcome, Etienne. Thanks, Guy. Thanks for ha having us. Water uh, on the way, asked... Marcus. Water. <laughs> uh, good morning. And uh, Etienne, thank you. you. I've received the uh, Natida Pinot Noir. 2019 and the Riesling 2020 from you. So <clears throat> the, the Durbanville Wine Valley has defined itself, I think, with three Ds, uh, drink, dine, and discover. So in order to give all my guests an opportunity to sell their fantastic award-winning offerings, I'm going to follow the triple D theme with each of you. And at the end, we can then touch on the other wineries in the Valley that you personally recommend, uh, besides your own, of course. So please, Feel free to chip in with a question or comment of your own, please, gentlemen, if you, if you have anything. Uh, this is an open conversation, really, not just me interviewing. Uh, I suppose the first place to start would be, uh, Charles, why have you selected these two wines for me to taste today in particular? Guys, sorry, I, I didn't prepare myself at all, so I can't answer. <laughs> no, I'm joking with you. I'm joking. <laughs> no, uh, guys, uh, I, I thought I thought you know I'm I'm confident, but of course the two wines we do purchase a bit of grapes, and and of course some of our wines is wine of origin Cape Town, uh, that used to be Durbanville, uh, so that two wines is both 100% from our farm, and I thought the 2021 was a a real special vintage um, in the sense that in my 34 years of making wine, it's probably the latest. And I think my two uh, winemaking friends uh, sitting, uh, joining us, so they will agree. It's probably one of the latest vintages I ever experienced and a really weird guy, uh, a small vintage. So, so in the past, uh, my definition of a small vintage was it was always early because the vine has so much less fruit to ripen. But this year it was small and late. But adding up or to capping that, I must say it's probably one of my most interesting and best quality vintages I've been working with. Uh, really, the, all the signs are there of a, a cool year with firm, high acidities. We never experienced, you know, one of the big concerns of a winemaker is not to experience from Verezon. That's more or less the first week in January where grapes start turning in color in the case of red, reddish. And, uh, you know, in the case of white fruit, the berry will become slightly more a different color of green or maybe slightly more towards a straw color. Sugar will pick up. Uh, the definition of it is on is basically uh, grabbing a berry from the cluster and can chew it and swallow it, you know. And from there till picking, that's in our case mid-February, 
uh, you want 40 days, 45 days, 50 days of very cool, moderate growing conditions. And we definitely experienced it this year with no heat spikes or heat waves. A heat spike is maybe just a quick up and down to 33 degrees, you know, in vintage, just like 2016. Uh, we had days and nights that was uh, higher than 33 degrees. That was really, you know, we were hammered by heat waves then. But this was an exceptional vintage. And I thought that Sauvignon Blanc that you have in your glass is a good expression of that. We literally bottled it two weeks ago. We were a bit under pressure with stock. And I sent it away for finer analysis. I'm very interested in thiols and methoxyperazines. And sometimes you get very confused. But anyway, um, for me, it's uh, uh, the, uh, the results of that is amazing. It's, it's uh, you know, if I compare it with all the previous diffrenal vintages of Sauvignon Blanc, this can definitely be what uh, will be remembered as one of the best Sauvignon Blanc years. And the Pinotage is growing here on the farm. You will see it's uh, a Mandelwurf, if I translate it straight, it's almond orchard. And um, it's, uh, there used to be an almond orchard on this spot on the farm. It's been uprooted years ago and replanted with pinotage. So this is one of our older blocks. And it's a pity we don't have more fruit. We have more or less a thousand cases, 1,300 cases to be exact of that. Uh, but I wish we had some a bit more pinuta, especially this year, because I think I can again, I think I'm talking on behalf of all three of us, pinuta's crops were quite low or quite small this year in the valley. And then guys, it's, just to add on, it's, it's fascinating if you look at Durbanville, we are slightly on the, call it the western side of the Teigerberg, and then if, like you explained, if you go around the corner and into that valley, we describe that valley all the way to Altet Gedag, uh, as the inner valley, and then the, the opposite side that you will probably do later on with Dimersdal, Kantu, and uh, Mierendal is the outer valley. Very interesting. I didn't know that. So that's a that's a reference that that you as winemakers have to the topography for your for yourselves, the inner and the outer valley. And of course, very different. Would it be very different climates for for the two, or just um, marginally different? <clears throat> yeah, we, we taste on a regular base. We, we, we just start our tasting group again of all the winemakers of the valley. In the past, we taste, it's not huge differences, but I think if you really want to be critical, you can say maybe the, the fruit profile is slightly different from the outer valley to the inner valley. Just uh, not, 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 anyone, not any of the two is better than the other. It's just the fact that it's, you know, the climatic conditions will slightly vary. You know, I think mm. the inner valley have this, uh, gateway to the ocean and the outer valley is slightly around the corner, uh, if I if I can use that as a description. Uh, I'm very grateful for the uh, the bottle of Pinotage. Now that I know there's only limited cases, I won't be opening <laughs> that in a hurry. I'll be coroning that. But um, uh, obviously, Denville, renowned for Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, I was fascinated on a recent visit to the Grendel um, to hear about the soils that you have there at the Grendel. And, and, and I picked up your, your real passion for this cultivar. What is it about Sauvignon Blanc that keeps you curious? And, and tell us about the two principal vineyards from, from which you harvest. Yeah, um, it's, you know, if you just, if I can take you in a, in a snip uh, back to the history, you know, that they say the first, I had to, I know this info because I had to prepare myself for a big Sauvignon Blanc presentation. The first signs of, of, drawings of Sauvignon Blanc leaves was in 1860, uh, 1860 from a farm called Boschenmeer, that's today, Groot Constantia. And, uh, you know, then the interesting, the first written um, documentation of Sauvignon Blanc was in 1946 at Simon's Flay from Sarl Rousseau. And uh, yeah, it's just you can imagine that times so that during that years the varieties that was so very popular was Polomino and France and varieties that's today not so uh, prominent anymore. But I will say the real father of Savio Blanc was the late Ross Gower from Klein Constantia. He produced a wine in 1985 that won then the Yanis Smuts Trophy. It was the only competition in South Africa, the Young Wine Show. And I taste that wine. I was really a rookie, a youngster. It's probably one of the best white wines I ever tried. So Ross Gower is for me unofficially the father of top quality Sauvignon Blanc. 
So guys, this is a variety that's very dependent on cool, moderate uh, conditions, growing conditions. You know, I always say that it's, I live in Paul, and of course, Paul is notoriously hot. And it's not uncommon in February for my wife to send me a WhatsApp to say it's 36 degrees in February. And then I will compare it on that in, uh, at that same time with the temperature around here, it will be 28. Now, my friend in wine, two degrees is massive. So leave alone 10 or 12 degrees. So our fruit take longer to ripen. We have higher acidity. And I think we have the, of the potential to produce different styles of Sauvignon Blanc. And if you look at the 10 or 12 wineries in the valley and have the wines in front of you, you will taste that all of them have a golden thread running through them due to the soil and the climate. I'll get to the soil just now. Um, but, uh, you know, they will slightly vary with that, which is uh, due to the, maybe the inner valley or the outer valley or a slightly variance in soil. But talking of soil, you know, there's, uh, in the world, I don't want to make it too technical. There's two main soil types. The one is called alluvial. Alluvial is where soil layers are deposited on one another over millions of years due to glaciers and, and water and wind and uh, um, uh, things that move around in the, in the earth, you know, that's sometimes a bit complicated. And then there's colluvial. Colluvial is soil that slide down due to gravity from a hill. And in Durban, well, we have colluvial soils. A uh, classic example, Guy, in, uh, if I can compare, for instance, Houdini, the area around Rosenlo, that's alluvial. You know, it's old riverbeds where the soils were deposited on one another. In our case in Durban, well, we have colluvial. And it quickly, when you work with colluvial soils, and I think my two friends here will agree, one of the big challenges is fertility. The vines tend to grow quite a bit more than in, 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 on an alluvial soil. So one of our challenges in the vineyards is to tame down and to subdue this growth. You know, then there's many different methods of doing that. You can pluck leaves, you can take a fertilizer away, you can stress the vine slightly, you know, that is each wine, each wine, we have its own methods. But uh, we have colluvial, but if I must uh, thin it down to one soil type, in Durban, well, it's Malmesbury Shale. There's two shales in South Africa, Bockefeld Shale and Malmesbury Shale. We have a classic example of blue-gray shale. If you don't believe me, drive around in the valley and look at the sides of the quarry. You will see this blue-gray color, especially after a rain shower. And um, so on our farm on top at 350 meters, 345 meters to be exact, uh, we have this blue big shells, chunks here, it's lying here somewhere. Um, and that's what we call a mispa. And as they move down the hill and roll and crush and weather and become smaller and slightly more rounder, they mix with topsoil. And then we call that a Glen Rosa. And as on the level, we're sitting now on 180 meters above sea level. Um, the stones again roll and crush over millions of years. They are much smaller. They're the size of, your, of the top of your thumb. And here it's met by a clay layer at two meters down that we refer to as an oak leaf. So that's, you know, I don't want to confuse your, your listeners uh, or, or people that will listen to this to, with different soil types. But that in a nutshell is colluvial, alluvial, um, Amersbury shale, and then the three types that's more or less the same in the valley is um, Mispa, Glen Rosa, and oak leaf. Phenomenal. And I think Pitti and Etienne can uh, both thank you because you've now clarified the technical <laughs> elements for everyone. Yeah, thank you. So the interview is done now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's always the nice thing to sit in uh, tastings or, or interviews with, uh, with Charles. You know, there's always something new that you learn. And I must say, uh, um, I can remember from Varsity days of things about colluvial and alluvial, whatever. But I mean, it uh, now that you explain it it, it, it makes so much sense. So thanks, Charlie. Yeah, it is the, the difference between you and me and Pretty is the fact that, you know, you sell all your wine in your tasting room. I must travel around and sell, so I need to learn all the stories. To, to <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, not, uh, uh, guys, this is, if, if it means anything to you, this is a classic example of the blue-gray color. And this is a mispa. This is lying on top of the table back. You can see it's quite sharp and aggressive. And what's so amazing about soil, half a million years later, this rock will weather and turn. And there you can see the gray color. It's smaller and it's a bit more rounder and it's mixed with topsoil. This is then the Glen Rosa portion. And then this is uh, one on the level we're sitting now. 
you can see if you can use your imagination half a million years later and then the ocean has pushed salt water underneath the mountain and, and, and deposit clay there. And that's where the layer of the two meters of clay at the bottom with this soil type on top called the oak leaf. Phenomenal. And I've encountered all three of those on my mountain bike up on those Tiger Bird Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Have you eaten some of it as well? <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Uh, Pity, I, I believe that there are, moving to you, there, there's plans afoot at Klein Roosboom for you to spin off your red blend, my way, into a standalone uh, range. So I'm guessing that that's why I'm being treated to this my way Sauvignon Blanc reserve. Uh, how did you arrive at, at, at this name? So it started out with the my way uh, derived from the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. Yep. And all the wines on Clan is 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 um, is a fa family or orientated. So all the wines are dedicated to a specific family member. And it started with a my way for the, uh, the owner, Karen de Villiers' father. He was just madly in love with the song. And with the song came the, came the uh, name My Way. And after a couple of years, we started working with um, with the My Way range to bring out to to, to separate the wines on on Clarisbon for a more prestigious range of, of wines that we can um, let the, let our new customers and and uh, wine connoisseurs enjoy. And so that's why we we started doing the My Way range. So in the My Way range is the the uh, red blend. That's a more of a Bordeaux style blend. Um, the Savia Blanc that is that you're tasting now is 100% free run juice. And the, I'm bringing out a MCC that's going to be released in November. Yeah, around about November for 20 months on the lease. So that's going to be a more prestigious range of, of wines that we can, that we can um, offer, offer all our customers. And is that uh, MCC going to compete with the um, the Marnay that you've uh, given me as well? Well, if it if it's not if it's not a competitor, then I should have put on an other label. But <laughs> the 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 idea is that the the My Way range is going to be a little bit more prestigious prestigious than the, the Marnay range. Got you. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, not to not to uh, force you into too much technicality, but we've certainly learned a lot about the soils from. Uh, Charles, and, and I, I know that when I first was studying Durbanville Hills wine specifically, there was uh, talk of the climate and how the, the cooling air and the mists and whatnot. Um, how, how do you, as Klein Ruspwim in that inner valley, how does your daytime climate differ from the likes of a, of a De Grendel, for example? It's usually in early mornings when you leave uh, from Durbanville to on your way to, to the Grendel side around the corner, you get down in this ditch and you will see this thick cloud of mist that is usually hanging around here. And so for a lot of years with with the mist and all this cool climate, it tends to, well, I've, 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 my personal opinion is I think there's a lot of uh, good qualities that comes from all that mist and the cool climates in the early mornings. The farm is situated on a, on a in this valley and in this valley, most of the vines are being grown on the southern hill, or the, the southern slopes. Mm. And so the sun tends to get or reach the grapes a lot at a lot later stage in the day than farms on a, on a flat uh, area surface or on a, on a northern facing slope. So I would, I can vouch for Sylvia Blanc grown on the southern slope is, I think, a better better way of going. Uh, the Marnay MCC, uh, got a beautiful dedication on the back label, by the way, uh, to you viewer. I highly recommend you get your hands on a bottle just to read that. Um, but I believe it's comprised of the classic sparkling varieties, the Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Noir. Are the Pinot grapes grown on the farm as well? Are you a complete estate? No, no, so we're not. Um, currently, we are in the process of, of uh, planting Pinot Noir for grown for, for 
just for the range of, of MCCs. And so currently we are buying and sourcing Pinot Noir from the owner's or Corrin's uh, uh, husband that passed away a couple of years ago. His brother has got a farm nearly about four kilometers away from here. So I, I would go out early mornings and harvest those Pinot Noir for the MCC ranges on four, four player as well. Okay. Uh, maybe you should talk to, to Etienne. Maybe he's got some Pinot Noir to sell you. Uh, Etienne Lowe, how does your grape growing at Natida vary from our other two guests? Well, I, I would say first and, first and foremost, uh, as I said before the, uh, before the interview guy, please go lightly on me. This is my first vintage at, uh, uh, at Natida. I started in August last year. So uh, it was a bit of a baptism of fire, but it's been a lot of fun, you know, and that's, uh, and uh, that's what, you know, that, that, that to me is a, it is a great aspect of what, of what wine making should be about. Uh, I changed careers to do so. So, so um, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, Firstly, we one of the we used to be the smallest farm in the Durbanville in the Durbanville Wine Valley. Um, I think Canto is a little bit smaller now. Uh, one of our one of our new members, but it's only thirty seven hectares in size, um, with only sixteen hectares under vine. So, um, and literally every um, every inch of fertile soil has been planted. Um, I spoke to the boss last week. Said, "Listen, can't we?" You know, can't we plant some Pinot Noir uh, on the on the uh, on the farm because you know the, the demand is the demand is growing? He said, "Listen, where uh, we don't have we don't have any any more space to plant." And um, so, and you know, I, I think the whole mentality from when the farm was started in, in or, or when Bernard when the Vella farm, family bought the farm in 1990 is um, very much to be self-sufficient uh you know we we have a um a small complement of staff very loyal staff i must say it, 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 it was an absolute pleasure um uh working with my harvesting crew the, uh, this year you know we are three people in the office uh, and or four people in the office the boss uh, with a boss um and we are um you, you know we are in, in constant contact with each other um regarding um styles and regarding um a marketing and and, and and all of that so so that to me has been a that to me has been a real eye opener um in terms of in terms of the growing um i mean we have predominantly south south facing slopes uh, which are all planted on white varieties um we um okay some of your blunt making out the bulk but but i mean we grow some interesting stuff like the riesling that you that you that you have there um Semyon has always been a calling card of uh, um, of of Natida, and this being my first vintage, I really had to get a grip on you know on what the chronology of the cultivars is and which blocks uh, ripen uh, earliest and, and all of that. And um, it takes one vintage, it takes one complete run through to kind of get your head around that. And uh, um, I must say, um, a little older, a little wiser. Um, I don't have any air, but uh, if that little bit that I had, you know, has probably uh, left me uh, with this uh, with this harvest. Uh, with this harvest, um, but uh, but it's been okay. fun. Yeah, I, I must say, uh, you talk of a passionate team. Uh, Jakus Mare, your sales and marketing manager, he's a great ambassador of your winery. Uh, he's done some phenomenal introductions for us, uh, and he and he's uh, made sure that I have a bottle of your. Calligraphy 2017 and your 2019 having your bunk for a future one-on-one, -on -one, which, as I say, I need to get to. Uh, but I wanted to ask about these two specifically. Why, why have you selected these two wines for me? Is it because you and I share a passion for hot Indian curry that uh, you decided <laughs> on the Riesling? Oh, man. Oh, one of my favorite things, and you know, this is probably not logically correct but if if i know i'm going to have like a hot curry or whatever i will put a bottle of that riesling in the fridge uh, no, in the freezer and then wait until it almost becomes to that little slushy uh consistency and yeah. then take it out with my with my hot food you know just just for the cooling <laughs> effect um but um from a winemaking perspective i love making unusual varieties in the in the south african in the south african context uh, you know it's a challenge it's a it's a, it's a bit of exploration it's fun and um and you know riesling this year was challenging 
because it was uh, you had a very narrow window between ripeness and the block rotting away for noble late harvest. So to get that pick point correct uh, was uh, we had a very small window to uh, to do that. And I mean, I I think German Rieslings are one of the finest white wines in the world. Um, I love that knife edge. Um, that, that, that walk that you take between sweetness and acidity, you know, all the, you know, it's a variety that ages well. It, it, it's so rewarding with a, uh, with a bit of age. So, so Riesling, I, I wanted to say something different uh, okay. uh, for, you, for, for you to look, look at. And the Pinot? No, Pinot, Pinot Noir. Um, Charles, I don't know if you can attest to this. Um, I, um, I remember before I made my first Pinot Noir, you know, everybody was talking about the heartbreak grape, and you thought, oh, I said, man, you know, these winemakers, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I mean, we can make any anything happen. Um, but uh, with your journey with Pinot Noir, you, you find out w uh, why that is. I remember, I think it was in 2014, that I lost an entire Pinot Noir vintage due to, uh, due to rot. Um, it was, uh, it's one of those varieties, almost like Gewurztraminer. If you look at it, it starts to rot. And, um, and, and the challenge with Pinot Noir this year was that the crops were way, way down. I mean, it's probably going to be one of the scarcest things to find this year is going to be 2021 Pinot Noir. And, and Pinot Noir has to be, um, you know, although it's referred to as, you know, as a feminine variety because it's all about the red fruit and it's all about, you know, you know that voluptuousness. Um, you know, it, uh, it it does carry quite a bit of uh, tannin, and it, and it is a wine that does uh, that does a that does age well, um, and um, you know, so you have to you have to treat it with great you have to treat it with great care. And so it's a bit counterintuitive than would you, than what you would do like a big fat cabernet in terms of the oaking and you know extracting wood tannin and all of that. And you have to just gently uh, you have to gently the winemaker mustn't get in the way with uh, uh, of Pinot. It's delicious. It really is. It's offering up some very interesting nuances on the nose that I wouldn't have uh, expected from a Pinot. So uh, that's that's something for me to go back to. And I, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to all your wines um, that I've poured once this is done so that I can just relax with it, because obviously we're, we're pushed for time with this conversation as well. Uh, Etienne, you've, you've worked at various Durbanville Wine Valley wineries. So, Groot for Santa Kral, Altijd Gedacht. What, in your opinion, sets the region apart from a Constantia, for example, that is now pinning its hopes on a Constantia Sauvignon Blanc route? Well, um, and anybody else is welcome to answer as well if you'd like to chip in and uh, don't leave Etienne out to dry. Yeah, so 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 I've made I've made wine for four for four different Durbanville wineries uh, um, up to now, and um, and there's a reason why I didn't want to want to leave Durbanville. You know, we are we are um, firstly I live in the suburbs. I live I live in I live in Aurora, and and my and it's literally five five minutes for me to get to to get to the farm. So you've got all the You've got all the advantages of, of living in the burbs, but but your your office is this beautiful is this beautiful uh, wine uh, this beautiful wine farm. So from a personal point of view, and and I've uh, I've been here for fourteen years, and I've uh, and I've always enjoyed the community. You know, we we only twelve or thirteen um, uh, wineries in the in the valley, and we all still get along, especially on the you know on the on the on the winemaking side. And uh, you know, I love that. Uh, I love that sense of uh, community. But when it comes when it comes to the wine, uh, Charles was talking about a golden thread uh, earlier. And uh, I, you know, if, if I think about the four farms that I that I work for, the, the flavor profiles in terms of the nose. You know, some might might have a bit more passion fruit, some a bit more green fig. Some it was actually quite herbaceous. But for me, the the golden thread was the mouthfeel on the on on the wines. I mean, Durbanville. You know, it, it it has that beautiful balance between um, natural acidity, but then the fullness on the mouthfeel is something that that is very difficult to emulate in in in, in areas which is not uh, which doesn't have our ideal climatic conditions. 
I think there's enough place in the sun for everyone when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you, you know, Constantia is also part of, of, of wine of origin Cape Town, so they are neighbours and they are they are colleagues in that in in, in that respect. But uh, I believe the wines must speak for itself. And 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 you know, if you go from Cruz for Santa Claus to the one side through to the Grendel on the other, you know, there is a the golden thread is uh, really high quality and 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 personality driven Sauvignon Blancs. Excellent. Uh, Guy, if I can add on there, I think we, we, we spoke about the geographic contrast being for us on the western side and then the inner valley and the outer valley. And, uh, you know, not, not at all being sarcastic about Constantia, but I think we're a bit bigger. You know, we have 12 wineries. And if I remember my facts correct, um, I think there's 1,550 hectares in, in, in the whole of Durbanville, 12 wineries. And of course, something interesting is that we have the big one of the stell called Durbanville Hills that I guess you will cover in the future. But you know, they harvest more as Durbanville fruit than the rest of us all together. And, and, and we, can, we can sort of uh, joke about that and say they're a small co-op, but they set the tone in a certain way, you know, because they, they have bigger volumes and they always some, so it's all, they make wines that you can always learn, uh, learn something from because the intake of fruit is different. They have like pitties, the, 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 the villiers, the free, a few de Villiers farms. And I think there's about pretty about 10 or 12 farms that deliver their grapes to Durbanville Hills. So they, they're slightly different. So it's from very small to quite big, you know, and uh, being a small private winery to a wholesaler. And uh, it, it, makes, it makes it very interesting. And of course, the golden thread that I refer to is the Savion Blanc, but then each winery have something unique up their sleeve, you know, making uh, from Barbera to Gewurztraminer, Riesling, Pinotage, uh, and that makes it quite fascinating. But, you know, I can know, uh, I know we're going to talk about the food and, the, and the, what the farms can offer. But I think just to summarize, Karen Ruiz, it's the, it's the, um, John, the John de Villiers' wife, the, uh, Karen uh, de Villiers, not Karen Ruiz, Karen de Villiers, uh, the late John's uh, um, wife, made a statement one day, and I, I still think it's one of the best statements you can ever think about, a slogan for this valley. You know, some people say we this, and some people say we that, but she used a slogan to say Durbanville is a place where friends meet. And that's for me very special, eh? very, very special. That's very true as well, because I can, I can echo experiences where friends have met at all three of your farms, and we've had tremendous experiences and, and bonding sessions. Uh, but that's for another day, I suppose. Uh, let's, let's talk that second D now, the dine. Uh, and, and we'll go back to you, Charles. Uh, De Grendel's restaurant, renowned for fine service and spectacular views. But there are, are there other uh, dining options available as well? You, you, if you book well in advance, you can um, you can organize a picnic here, and, and um, an old colleague of mine will take you on a, on a wildlife a wild uh, gap, sorry, wildlife a game drive, and then they can, you can stop wherever, and they, you uh, you can have a picnic with a glass of wine. That's quite special, and of course, in our tasting room, what we call the stoop and the tasting lounge, you can also have a small snack. But it needs to be booked in advance. But that's our three options on uh, you know. Uh, entertaining clients and of course we have uh, via our, our loyalty club once a month a loyalty club evening that we advertise it can book quite quickly and uh, it's uh, before COVID we had a small tutor tasting of four or five wines and then walk down to the restaurant and, and have a, a free course meal with six wines and, and between Ian and myself we'll take you through the different courses and uh, the wines. It's, it's a quite a fun evening. Uh, it was a bit quiet, of course, due to COVID. Uh, now people are a bit cautious, but um, mm. it's still fully booked every month. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, and and Pity Kutsia, Klein Roosboom, you've had some uh, some changes there. Uh, you've really upped your, your, your dining game, if I may say, in terms of that fantastic restaurant, uh, Jean, with the, the, the glass. Um, can't remember when we were last there, but uh, it, it, it seems to have been reimagined. Uh, tell us a bit about the food offering that you have. So um, the whole John restaurant started out as a fine dining with a rustic, uh, funky, quirky twist. And um, due to COVID, we had to strategize how to still incorporate this into the whole restaurant theme. Um, so 
it evolved into a full-on deli. And then through the deli, through the COVID, almost subsided. Um, it started to take foot on people coming in, um, throwing a bunch of deli foods and all nice quiches and, and brownies and fresh baked breads uh, into a basket and they can have a picnic in, in the vineyards. And um, so it evolved in a more of a family style, very, very light mood, but still, still fun and energetic with lots of, lots of great wines. Um, to experience the whole Klein Risk Worm uh, um, setup. And so with all these frost, fresh produce that, um, that the chef, <coughs> that chef uh, Laurent Heinz uh, 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 puts on the table, you've, you still get this menu that you can order from. So it's hot food that you can order to your, to your table if you want to book in advance for a table. Mm -hmm. um, you can um, sit down and have a nice meal and then take a walk around on the farm that we set out routes that um, that people can enjoy and just enjoy an environment that um, i think everybody should be should be uh, can experience when 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 the the, the date <coughs> sorry when the date arrives um for a nice walk in the in the vineyards and the fresh air and on the other side of the farm or not on the other side um, it's a merely 10 meters away uh, you get the, the wine experience where people can order. Um, it's a wine tasting room. It's an old, old part of the cellar that uh, that we broke through the cement tanks, forty thousand liter cement tanks that we that we themed. So you get this different style of themes inside the cement tanks where where people can sit down and have a, a meat or a cheese platter and enjoy it with a with a wine tasting. Oh, no. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, you 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 referred to a wine tasting room, but it's 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 whew, yeah. what an experience! It's a cave uh, of <laughs> exploration. Yeah, it's so yeah. great. Please, please, please don't call it a cave. A lot of people had some, had to make some some judgmental comments on on they arrived here and said, "Well, where's where's the caves? You know, I, I need a I need a cave." It's, <laughs> So it's it, not they, literal, man. Not literal, <laughs> eh? Yeah. Um, Etienne, there's some dissension in the McDonald ranks here. My wife oh. loves Tables Restaurant, and I'm a much bigger fan of Cassia. What does that say about us as people? <laughs> that you both have immaculate taste. <laughs> oh, guys, <laughs> two, fantastic, two fantastic guys, choices. Uh, guys, sorry, I must chip in. I must chip in. You have a much more expensive uh, uh, taste than your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. She's from Edgemead originally, and I'm. <laughs> I won't say where. So yes, you're right. Uh, Guy, may, may I ask, is there children in the, in the McDonald uh, in the McDonald household? No, and that's why I'm saying, why must we go to tables? There's no children. We'll go there when there are children. Because <laughs> that's because that's generally the that's generally the defining factor. If you if you have if you have kids, you know, tables is more suitable because you know we've got the outside playroom. We've got these you know these big enormous lawns for them to to, to run around. And there's a play park and there's a kiddies menu and and all of that. And it's a bit more informal and and, and more almost like cafe society um, uh, style meals. Where Cassia is, is definitely uh, a more of a, a fine dining, a fine dining experience. But I mean, even if you even if if you bring a, your kids along to Cassia, they can run along the dam, whatever. Um, they must just make sure that that the cannon isn't firing on that day on that day because that that thing makes uh, one hell of a noise. I mean, we we've got we've got four or five. Uh, cannons that 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 can still be that can still be fired and they still and they they supposed to warn us when they're going to be firing that day but but those two the two cannoneers they they usually don't so i mean we always get one one more when we you know when those when those when those cannons go off in the in the afternoon but uh but yeah the biggest compliment i can give the i can give the two restaurants is um you know even on the weekends I come I come back to my working place and I come and eat at the at the at the restaurants because I I I, I love the atmosphere and I love the uh, I and I and I don't get stock discounts so uh, you know I'm a I'm a paying customer so yeah but 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 uh, I, I really enjoy the atmosphere. Yeah. It is, be, be truthful, my friend. Be truthful. You you all your meat is not free there. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm an old smoke. <laughs> Charles, you, you mentioned, uh, and I think you were referring to Douglas, the excellent host who takes you around the farm where you can take in the views. Uh, we did that. Thank you very much for, for that opportunity to go on that uh, game drive vehicle. Uh, you see the likes of uh, Springbok, Elant, uh, Red Harder Beast, um, Bontebok, and you get to learn about the, the wines of De Grendel. Uh, just... Uh, Uh, the, and, and of course, um, you also get to learn about the, the history of the farm and the, and the Graf family. So um, would, would, would you say that is the, the, the main offering besides the wine tasting and, and the restaurant that you would recommend? I believe you can uh, take a picnic on that uh, drive as well. Yeah. No, guys, that is what we offer, you know. It's, so we get so many requests for... Um, mountain bike, people want to practice here and, and cycle a bit on the farm, but it, to control that is not so easy. And the last thing I think that we as a farm want to be uh, chopped or seen as a place, a dangerous place where a guy can fall down and hurt himself. And of course, it all comes with the, with the sport. But yeah, the three things we can offer is, uh, I think, a very good tasting in, uh, in a tasting lounge or in the, on the stoop if you want to have it more, slightly more relaxed with a snack plate there. Um, and then the restaurant, of course, and the, the game drive with Douglas and a picnic on that trip if you want to book, if you can book that in advance. But that's what we can offer. Excellent. Uh, Petit Klein Roosboom des describes itself as Cape Town's best kept secret. So let us in on a, a secret or two that we must come and discover. Uh, I, I believe you have something called a party bike. Yeah, okay, so... <laughs> The whole best kept secret started out with, with we, we saw customers uh, living in Dermville, you know, so close by, and um, living in Dermville, and then they, he would start talking with them, and it was, they would say, oh, after five, six, ten years, I didn't even know you guys existed yet. Just for the fact that usually you just drive, drive by. You're so in a hurry to work and from work, on this stretch of road, it just people just tend to focus to get to work and back, and um, we, we hence the the biscuit secret. Um, the party bike, it's uh, you everybody anybody can visit the website Holy, and um, make you make a booking uh, for the for the party bike. What do you say, Etienne? Yeah, <laughs> you must listen carefully to this now. This is quite, this is quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the party bike um, it's, uh, can be enjoyed by anybody. Um, the party bike idea is, yeah, it's, uh, it's not an idea. It's not it's what you put in, you can get out. So for every kilojoule you burn by cycling on this, on this bike, you can, you, can, you can waver that kilojoule with another kilojoule you can put into your glass, into your mouth. So you can, you can have a, a nice scenic drive around the the dam on the party bike um there's a couple of options you can do you can you can order your own picnic basket or your picnic as i said from the deli and uh, enjoy a snack along the way for the for the guys that uh, needs all the carbs and the proteins and the stuff and um you can you can watch it down with a glass of wine or you can order in a caterer to or not a caterer a bartender to attend you with with your drinks while driving this party bike. So the party bike is a, uh, if I remember correct, it's a 12 seat yeah. party bike. Um, so 12 people can, can, can join in on the fun and um, exercise while, while drinking. I, I think that's the, probably the, the best uh, um, slogan that, that anybody can, can offer that is a fitness, fitness junkie. So it's, it's really all about balance, balance of kilojoules, Balance on, on a bike, which is sustained by other people that are joining you on that bike. That, so you, that that is correct. The balance <laughs> balance is 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 probably the most most exciting thing of all. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, I've never I've never tried it. I've got to come and give that a go. Etienne, tasting wine at Natida, obviously a unique experience on the Dermville wine route. You you can kind of feel like you're part of the wine making process. You sit there inside the cellar, surrounded by the wine barrels and. Uh, staff are busy working, blending, uh, cannons are firing. What else is there for us to discover at the Tita? 
Yeah, well, I, th- I mean, we, 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 talk, we, we spoke all about the restaurants. I mean, that, that's become, uh, I mean, that's the real drawing card. You know, we found, especially post-COVID, that, 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 that people are, are um, for their dining experiences, are moving closer to home. And, you know, so, so we've had absolutely phenomenal um, support from the, from, the local, from the local community um, you know, in terms of the support of our, of our restaurants. Uh, um, but in, in the tasting in the tasting room, I mean, we do we do some interesting things. We do a sensorial tasting where you you get a wine and there's a little packet of something to sniff or something to to uh, to chew that uh, that uh, that emulates the flavor that you that you get in the wine. We even have little kiddies tastings. Got all kinds of sweeties and stuff, um, and, and those leftover sweeties that that lie around, we you know we we, we pick them off. Um, um, but as you say, I mean, it's it, it's very. We've got a very compact setup. You know, our wine storage and our barrels and our tasting room and our cellar is you know you know is all within you know very uh, very small confines. So it does make for a for a unique exp- uh, for a unique experience uh, that you really uh, get in touch with the winemaking process. Gentlemen, I know you've got places to be and things to do, so I'm going to wrap with one more question, and that's for load shedding. Me. Load shedding is coming at them. Yeah, assuming you have free time, uh, which other Durbanville estate besides your own would you recommend we visit and why? Let's start with Charles. Oh, gee, that's unfair, guys. It's, uh, it's whatever one you mention. Uh, like I mentioned, I think each of them have something unique. Um, but I, I will say, Natida, I'm actually planning to bring my, my cellar team to have a bite at, at uh, Klein Roosterum. I've never been there since the restaurant is open. But I like the Tito, the fact that the winery is slightly at the back and there's the restaurant in between the dam and, of course, uh, the restaurant here as you enter with the, uh, I love a dam and it always makes me a bit, you know, the, that have that tranquil effect, the dam with water and some birds on it and fish in the water. So I love the Tito, I must say. Betty, for you? Uh, I would say... It's it's not a, a cellar pronounced cellar, but uh, I would say Maastricht that is close to close to um, Etienne Natida, just op- on, the, on the opposite uh, side of the road, with this lovely uh, old, very old building that is uh, probably you can probably put it in the historical books of a of a building on in Durnville. but um, yeah, lovely lovely views, lovely wines. So I would definitely recommend to 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 pop in there for for a tasting. And Etienne, finally from you, sir, where else besides Natida or De Grendel or Klein Roosboer? Well, I can, I can uh, uh, laud the praises of all the, you know, of all the, the, the different farms on the, uh, on the valley. Uh, I'm a, but I would, from my side, I would recommend Goed for Santa Kral, you know, especially if people have not been to the restaurant. It is an, it's an eye-opening experience. Um, I... They probably serve one of the best breakfast in the uh, in the valley, and it's all you know, it's all interesting and dollied up and and uh, and, and 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 friendly service and and and, and um, you know the building as well in which the, the, the restaurant is is situated is an old historic building that's so that's been so beautifully some life being blown up into it uh, or into it. Uh, I can really re- recommend it to some Thank you, gentlemen, for your time this morning. I am absolutely loving the Sauvignon Blanc. So I have to tell you how interesting it's been for me in terms of uh, initially the uh, De Grendel gave me herbaceous notes, but now that it's been sitting in the glass for longer, there's that lovely fruit that's coming through and um, I'm getting hints of guava, passion fruit as well there. Uh, and, the, and the opposite is true of, of yours, Pity. Yours, I was getting a, a, a lot of fruit initially and now it's becoming... Um, more herbaceous in, in, in nature as it's been sitting. So that's been fascinating for me. Uh, and this Pinot Noir, I, first thing I got was chocolate. And I thought, no, you don't get chocolate on Pinot Noir. But there is a, there is a it, it's like a rich, um, fruity dark chocolate that's now sort of coming through as well, which is very interesting. So um, thank you for spoiling me with these wines. And of course we give you the opportunity to win a mixed case of each of the two wines that uh, we feature here today so that you can uh, watch this interview again and you can uh, taste along and you can get a real feel for each of these wineries. Uh, For your time, I say thank you very much, sir.
gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Guy. It's a privilege. Thanks, Guy. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Guy. And of course, uh, this via the grapevine was brought to you by Liquor City Claremont. Visit their wine emporium for a journey via the grapevine.